wine and gambling. The second stage was when Allah instructed them that it is forbidden for you to approach, to pray when you are oh, intoxicated, no. when you are drunk. So Allah tells them, stay away from prayer when you are intoxicated. This meant that you have a short period, an True. interval between prayers. The longest is between Fajr and Isha and Fajr then. You have to reverse it. So the, the, the longest period between two prayers would be from Isha prayer, which is the night prayer, and dawn prayer, Fajr prayer. So this was the only time for them to drink, drink and then they can be sober by Fajr prayer. So this was stage two. So this meant that a lot of the Muslims did not have time to drink because, as we know, they started their day before br the break of dawn. Imagine that. They started the day before the break of dawn, and by night time, by 8 o'clock p.m. or 7 o'clock p.m., where Isha prayer was called for, they prayed and went to bed immediately. Does it make a hint, uh, like, you know, does it give them a hint, I mean, that they are doing something, you know, wrong, or they could feel guilty a little bit, or at least feeling uncomfortable in their chest that they're doing something they have to be a little bit away and be careful when they deal with it. Of course, this is natural because, mm. as I said in the beginning, they didn't feel comfortable doing it, but it's a habit. They've been born, raised uh, on. Yeah. So it, they feel difficult doing it because they felt it's ungodly. They felt it's un-Islamic. But mm. at the same time, they had to do it because it, it's their lifestyle. Mm. So when this came, they knew that fewer people only could stay awake after Isha pr prayer. Mm -hmm. And just to give you a sample of what was going on, it, we were told in an authentic hadith that the Prophet ﷺ once prayed Al-Fajr. And after praying Al-Fajr, he looked at his companions and said, Who followed a funeral today? Today meaning... In, yeah. in, in, in the hours ago, Abu Bakr said, I did. Then he asked another question, who fed a poor person? Abu Bakr said, I did. Who visited a sick person? Abu Bakr said, I did. Who is fasting today? Abu Bakr said, I did. All four things were with Abu Bakr in the span of the night time. So, the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, these four things, whomever are collected in, in the same day, will enter paradise. And this is also one of the glad, one of the so many glad tidings to Abu Bakr that he is in paradise. So, stage two, do not approach, do not pray when you are intoxicated. And then came the final instruction from Allah Azza wa Jal, that... Verily, gambling and drinking wine and drawing lots and uh, uh, slaughtering uh, uh, sheep or sacrifice to the idols are all from the acts of Satan. So stay away from it completely, period. So Allah tells us that it is forbidden for you to approach or be close to intoxicants. Now, having said that, the Prophet ﷺ cursed 10 who are connected to wine or intoxicants. So anyone who comes even close to uh, preparing or getting these uh, uh, drinks or intoxications ready is cursed by Allah Azza wa Jal. For example, if someone grows fruit, plants or, or, or uh, grapes for the sake of making wine, he is cursed. Those who sell it, who make it, who carry it, who buy it, who it is carried for, who serves it, and so on. Ten people are cursed in wine. It is also reported that the Prophet ﷺ said that he who believes in Allah and on the Day of Judgment 
must not sit on a table where people are drinking wine. So even if you're in, uh, uh, on a business dinner, even if you are with people you would like to call them to Islam, and you're dining with them, and one of them drinks a beer or drinks alcohol, beverages, it is forbidden for you to join them. You have to leave immediately and, and, and on the spot. Some people said, Sheikh, that we are allowed to sell the wine to the un-Muslims. For instance, if I'm in America or in the UK, I can sell it for the non-Muslims. The I'm answer allowed. would be it is completely forbidden. And by selling them, you are exactly as if you are drinking it. Because regardless who you're selling it to, whenever Allah Azza wa Jal makes something, and this is a hadith, whenever Allah Azza wa Jal makes something forbidden for us to consume, it is also forbidden for us to sell. So you cannot work in a hotel or in a restaurant or uh, you cannot s uh, in a supermarket where they sell alcohol beverages because you will be part of that and you will take the sin of those who drink it. The third year of Hijrah was a tragic year for what took place in the Battle of Uhud. All that reputation and strength that the Muslims managed with the grace of Allah to gain in the first, second, and the beginning of the third year of Hijrah was gone with the wind. With what happened in, ba in the Battle of Badr, people were encouraged to go again and try to attack the Muslims. And by the people we mean uh, the, Jews, the Jews, the polytheists around the uh, uh, Medina, and also the hypocrites. Now they are encouraged because they thought that it is easy for us to defeat the Muslims as they are weakened now and they are not as strong and, 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 and brave as we thought. Therefore, if we look at the events afterwards, we would see that there were the tribes of Adl and Qara were encouraged to go and attack the companions of the Prophet ﷺ with a trick they made where they accompanied 10 of the companions as to call them for Islam and then they executed them. And also we find that the Bedouins in Najd in Bani Amir also killed 70 of the best companions of the Prophet ﷺ who were known to be the Qurra. And also the Jews of Bani, Bani al nadir tried themselves to assassinate the Prophet ﷺ. And all of these attacks came in a very short span of time. And had it not been for the grace of Allah, and had it not been for the wisdom of the Prophet ﷺ, if these attacks managed to succeed, the Prophet ﷺ's effort in building this nation of Islam would have gone in vain. But alhamdulillah, the Prophet ﷺ took certain measures to reinstall the trust and, and, and fear in the hearts of the non-Muslims. And among the very first was going after the Battle of Badr to Hamra yes. al-Asad. Because everybody thought that it, this was the end of Islam. But when they were... After the Battle of Uhud. Uh, well, not Battle of Uhud. Yeah, at the Battle of Uhud, they thought that this was the end of the Islam. But when the Prophet ﷺ went to Hamra al-Asad, the following day, with only those who were injured, with only the, those who were with him yesterday, everybody started having second thoughts. Well, maybe this is not yet the end, but we will give it a shot and we will give it a try. Sheikh, we can say that the Muslims' army lose the battle in Bad in Uhud, or we can... No, they have not, they have not lost the battle in Uhud, as we have mentioned that earlier. Uh, we said that they did not lose, but it was, they were not victorious as they were in Badr. Because they've lost 70 of their best men. And at the same time, the polytheist army were satisfied 
of these casualties and they were happy to go home with only 30 or 40 casualties of their own. If it, it would have been a defeat for the Muslim army if the Polythist army managed to beat us in Uhud and then move on to enter Medina. But this was and not... Murder, a murder the Prophet as well as they came for, but they couldn't do it. And it was one of the main points really that they started up the... Of course, this the is war. their main objective was to kill yeah. the Prophet ﷺ. But they didn't even uh, 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 succeed in achieving this. So this meant that it was almost a draw because they just were satisfied in going back to Mecca with what they have done. And that is why Abu Sufyan said that clearly that we're coming next year to attack you. And even in the middle of the way when they had their second thoughts and they wanted to go back, once they knew that the Prophet ﷺ is waiting from the, for them in Hamra al-Asad, they were afraid and they called it a day and went back to Mecca. Going back to the events of the following year, this is the fourth year of Hijrah. The Prophet ﷺ, in his current situation, to the, all the Arabs, to Jews, and to the hypocrites in Medina, was considered to be in a weak position. So, he had to change their opinion. They had to, he had to do something to change the idea that the people had. So what he did was, he heard that Tulayha and his brother Salama ibn Khuwaylid from Bani Asad were trying to uh, uh, collect and gather their people to attack Medina. So the Prophet ﷺ sent one of his companions to go and attack them. And this uh, companion of his was Abu Salama al, uh, uh, ibn Abd al-Asad al-Makhzumi. May Allah be pleased with him. And he gave him a flag and told him, go and fight them and bring them to justice. And he went. This Tulayha ibn, uh, ibn Khuwaylid, this man was one of those at the end, at the, uh, when the Prophet ﷺ died, who claimed to be a prophet himself. He reverted to Islam and then after the death of the Prophet ﷺ, he went back to disbelieving and claiming to be uh, a prophet himself. His story and what Abu Salama did with him is inshallah what we will discuss next time we meet. So until then, fi amanillah. والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته